After three days, Most Holy Mary and St. Joseph find the child Jesus in the temple, disputing with the teachers. In the foregoing chapter, a partial answer might be found to the question raised by some as to how the Heavenly Queen, who was so diligent and solicitous in attending upon and serving her Most Holy Son, could ever so far lose him out of sight as to leave him in Jerusalem. Although it would be sufficient answer to say that the Lord himself brought it about, Yet I will now explain more fully how it could have happened without any voluntary negligence or oversight of the loving mother. It is certain that besides availing himself of the great concourse of people, our Lord was obliged to use also supernatural means to elude the attention of his solicitous mother, for without it she could no more have lost sight of him than of the sun that lighted her on the way. Therefore, at the parting of the men and women which I mentioned, the Almighty Lord visited his heavenly mother with an abstractive vision of the divinity which, with divine power, centered and withdrew all her faculties toward her interior. Thus she remained so abstracted, inflamed, and deprived of her senses that she could make use of them only in so far it was necessary to pursue her way. As to all the rest, she was entirely lost in the sweetness and consolation of the divine vision. St. Joseph was guided in his behavior by the circumstances already mentioned, although he was also wrapped in a most exalted contemplation, which made more easy and mysterious his error in regard to the whereabouts of the child. Thus Jesus withdrew himself from both of them, remaining in Jerusalem. When after a considerable while the queen came to herself and found herself without the company of her most holy son, she supposed him to be with his reputed father. It was very near to the gate of the city that the divine child turned and hastened back through the streets, foreseeing in his divine foreknowledge all that was to happen, he offered it up to his eternal father for the benefit of souls. <clears throat> he asked for alms during these three days in order to ennoble en from that time on humble mendicity as the firstborn of holy poverty. He visited the hospitals of the poor, consoling them and giving them the alms which he had received. Secretly, he restored bodily health to some and spiritual health to many by enlightening them interiorly and leading them back to the way of salvation. On some of the benefactors who gave him alms, he performed these wonders with a greater abundance of grace and light, thus fulfilling from that time on the promise which he was afterwards to make to his church, that he who gives to the just and to the prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive the reward of the just. Having thus busied himself with these and other works of his father, he betook himself to the temple. On the day which the evangelist mentions, it happened that also the rabbis, who were the learned teachers of the temple, met in a certain part of the buildings in order to confer among themselves concerning some doubtful points of holy scriptures. On this occasion, the coming of the Messiah was discussed, for on account of the report of the wonderful events which had spread about since the birth of the Baptist and the visit of the kings of the East, the rumor of the coming of the Redeemer, and of his being already in the world, although yet unknown, had gained ground among the Jews. They were all seated in their places, filled with the sense of authority customary to those who are teachers and considered as learned. The child Jesus came to the meeting of these distinguished men, and he that was the King of kings, Lord of lords, the infinite wisdom itself, and who corrects the wise, presented himself before the teachers of this world as an humble disciple, giving them to understand that he had come to hear the discussion and inform himself on the question treated of, namely, whether the Messiah was already come, or if not, concerning the time in which he should come into the world. The opinions of the scribes were much at variance on this question, some of them answering in the affirmative, others in the negative. Those in the negative quoted some testimonies of holy scriptures and prophecies with the coarse interpretation 
reprehended by the apostle, namely killing the spirit by the letter. They maintained that the Messiah was to come with kingly magnificence and display it in order to secure the liberty of his people by the exercise of great power, rescuing them in a temporal manner from the slavery of the Gentiles. Yet, that there were no indications of this power and freedom in the present state of the Hebrews and no possibility of throwing off the yoke of the Romans. This outward circumstance was an argument of great force among this carnal and blinded people, for they presumed that the coming greatness and majesty of the promised Messiah and the redemption was intended for themselves only. And they believed this redemption to be temporal and earthly, just as even now the Jews in the obscurity which envelops their hearts continue to believe. For to the present day they have not yet come to realize that the glory, the majesty, and the power of the Redeemer and the liberty which he is to bring to the world is not of an earthly, temporal, and perishable kind, but heavenly, spiritual, and eternal, and that it is not intended alone for the Jews, although offered to them before all other nations, but indiscriminately for the whole human race descended from Adam. The teacher of truth, Jesus, foresaw that the discussion would end with the confirmation of this error, for although some of the learned men inclined to the contrary opinion, they were but few, and they had now been silenced by the authority and specious arguments of the others. As the Lord had come into the world in order to give testimony of the truth, which was he himself, he would not on this occasion, when it was so important to manifest the truth, allow the deceit and error opposed to it should be confirmed and established by the authority of the learned. His measureless charity could not pass by unnoticed. This ignorance of his works and high purposes in these men, who were set as teachers of the people in matters concerning eternal life, and its author, our Redeemer. Therefore, the divine child presented himself to the disputants, manifesting the grace poured out over his lips. He stepped into their midst with exceeding majesty and grace, as one who would propose some doubt or solution. By his pleasing appearance, he awakened in the hearts of these learned men a desire to hear him attentively. The divine child spoke to them as follows. The question concerning the coming of the Messiah and the answer given to it, I have heard and understood completely. In order to propose my difficulty in regard to its solution, I presuppose what the prophets say, that his coming shall be in great power and majesty, which also has been confirmed by the testimonies brought forward. For Isaiah says that he shall be our lawgiver and king, who shall save his people. And David, that he shall crush all his enemies. Daniel, that all tribes and nations shall serve him. Ecclesiasticus, that he shall come with a great multitude of saints. <coughs> all the prophets and scriptures are full of similar promises, manifesting his characteristics clearly and decisively enough for all those that study them with enlightened attention. But the doubt arises from the comparison of these with other passages in the prophets, since all of them must be equally true, though on account of their brevity they may appear to contradict each other. Therefore, they must agree with each other in another sense, which can and must be found equally applicable in all the passages. How then shall we understand what this same Isaiah says of him, that he shall come from the land of the living, and when he asks who shall declare his generation, that he shall be satiated with reproach, that he shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter, <coughs> and that he shall not open his mouth. Jeremiah states that the enemies of the Messiah shall join hands to persecute him and mix poison with his bread, and they shall wipe out his name from the earth, although they shall not prevail in their attempt. David says that he shall be the reproach of the people and of men, and shall be trodden underfoot, and shall be despised as a worm. Zachary, that he shall come meek and humble, seated upon an insignificant beast. All the prophets say the same concerning the signs of the promised Messiah. 
Hence, added the divine child, how will it be possible to reconcile these prophecies if we suppose that the Messiah is to come with power and majesty of arms in order to conquer all the kings and monarchs by violence and foreign bloodshed? <coughs> We cannot fail to see that he is to come twice, once to redeem the world, and a second time to judge it. The prophecies must be applied to both these comings, giving to each one its right explanation. As the purposes of these comings are different, so must also the conditions be different. For he is not to exercise the same office in both, but widely divergent and opposite offices. In the first advent, he is to overthrow the demon, hurling him from his sovereignty over souls obtained through the first sin. And therefore, he must first render satisfaction to God for the whole human race. Then also teach men by his word and example the way of eternal life. How they are to overcome their enemies, serve and adore their God and Redeemer. And how they must correspond to the gifts and use well the blessings of his right hand. All these requirements the Messiah must fulfill in the first coming. The second coming is for the purpose of exacting an account from all men in the general judgment of giving to giving to each one the return for his works good or bad chastising his enemies in his wrath and indignation this is what the prophets say of his second coming accordingly when we wish to understand how his first coming shall be in power and majesty or as david says he shall reign from sea to sea that in his advent he shall be glorious and as said by the other prophets all this cannot be interpreted as referring to visible and terrestrial sovereignty with all its outward show of pomp and majesty, but of a spiritual reign in a new church which would be extended over all the earth with sovereign power and riches of grace and virtue in opposition to the demon. By this interpretation, the whole scripture becomes clear, while in another sense, its different parts cannot be made to harmonize. That the people of the Jews are under dominion of the Romans and are in no condition to restore their sovereignty, not only cannot be held as a proof of his not having come, but on the contrary, is an infallible sign that he has already come into the world. For our patriarch Jacob has pointed out this very sign for the guidance of his posterity, commanding them to expect the Messiah as soon as they should see the tribe of Judah deprived of the scepter and sovereignty of Israel. And you must confess that neither Judah nor any other tribe of Israel can hope to recover or hold it. This same is also proved by the weeks of Daniel, which must certainly be now complete. Those who wish can also remember that a few years ago a light was seen in Bethlehem at midnight and that some poor shepherds heard the message of a newborn redeemer and that soon after some kings of the east came guided by a star seeking the king of the Jews in order to adore him. All this had been prophesied. Herod, the father of Archelaus, believing it an established fact, took away the life of so many children, hoping thereby to destroy the newborn king, whom he feared as his rival in the government of Israel. Other arguments to the child Jesus add, while seeming to ask questions, he taught with a divine efficacy. The scribes and learned men who heard him were all dumbfounded, Convinced by his arguments, they looked at each other and in great astonishment asked, What miracle is this, and what prodigy of a boy? Whence has he come, and who is the child? But, though thus astonished, they did not recognize or suspect who it was that thus taught and enlightened them concerning such an important truth. During this time, and before before Jesus had finished his argument, his most holy mother and St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse, arrived just in time to hear him advance his last arguments. When he had finished, all the teachers of the law arose with stupendous amazement. The heavenly lady, absorbed in joy, approached her most loving son, and in the presence of the whole assembly spoke to him the words recorded by St. Luke. Son, why hast thou done so to us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. 
this loving complaint the heavenly mother uttered with equal reverence and affection, adoring him as God and manifesting her maternal affliction. The Lord answered, Why is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? The evangelist says that they did not understand the mystery of these words, for it was hidden at the time to Most Holy Mary and St. Joseph, and for two reasons. On the one hand, the interior joy of now reaping what they had sown in so much sorrow, and the visible presence of their precious treasure entirely filled the faculties of their souls, and on the other hand, the time for the full comprehension of what had just been treated of in this discussion had not yet arrived for them. Moreover, for the most solicitous queen, there was another hindrance just at that time, and it was that the veil concealing the interior of her most holy son had again intervened and was not removed until some time later. The learned men departed, commenting in their amazement upon the wonderful event by which they had been privileged to hear the teaching of eternal wisdom, though they did not recognize it. Being thus left almost alone, the Blessed Mother, embracing him with maternal affection, said to him, Permit my longing heart, my son, to give expression to its sorrow and pain, so that it may not die of grief as long as it can be of use to thee. Do not cast me off from thy sight, but accept me as thy slave. If it was my negligence which deprived me of thy presence, pardon me and make me worthy of thy company, and do not punish me with thy absence. The divine child received her with signs of pleasure and offered, offered himself as her teacher and companion until the proper time should arrive. Thus was the dove-like and affectionate heart of the great lady appeased, and they departed for Nazareth. But at some distance from Jerusalem, when they were alone upon the road, the most prudent lady fell on her knees before her son and adored him, asking his benediction, for she had not thus reverenced him openly in the presence of the people in the temple, being always anxious to conduct herself with the perfection of holiness. With loving tenderness, the child Jesus raised her from the ground and spoke to her words of sweet sweet as comfort. Immediately the veil fell, revealing anew his most holy soul with greater depth and clear, clearness than ever before. <clears throat> then the heavenly mother read and perceived in the interior of her most holy son all the mysteries of his doings during those three days in Jerusalem. She understood also all that had passed in the dispute with the doctors, what Jesus had said, and why he did not manifest himself more clearly as the true Messiah. Many other sacramental secrets he revealed to his virgin mother, depositing them with her as in an archive of all the treasures of the incarnate word, in order that thence he might receive for all of them the return of honor and praise due to him as author of such great wonders. And she, the Virgin Mother, fulfilled all the expectations of the Lord. She, then she asked him to rest a while in the field and partake of some nourishment. He accepted it from the hands of the Great Lady, the attentive Mother of Divine Wisdom. Instruction given to me by the Most Holy Mary, the Queen of Heaven. My daughter... All the works of my most holy Son and my own actions are full of mysterious instruction and doctrine for the mortals who contemplate them diligently and reverently. The Lord absented himself from me in order that seeking him in sorrow and tears I might find him again in joy and with abundant fruits for my soul. I desire that thou imitate me in this mystery and seek him with such earnestness as to be consumed with a continual longing without ever in thy whole life coming to any rest until thou holdst him and canst lose him no more. In order that thou mayest understand better this sacrament of the Lord, remember that the infinite wisdom made men capable of his eternal felicity and placed them on the way to this happiness, but left them in doubt of its attainment as long as they have not yet acquired it, and thus filled them with joyful hope and sorrowful fear of its final acquisition. This anxiety engenders in men a lifelong fear and abhorrence of sin by which alone they can be deprived of beatitude and thus prevent them from being ensnared and misled by the corporal and visible things of this earth. This anxiety the Creator assists by adding to the natural reasoning powers, faith, 
and hope, which are the spurs of their love towards seeking and finding their last end. Besides these virtues and others infused at baptism, he sends his inspirations and helps to keep awake the soul in the absence of its Lord and to prevent forgetfulness of him and of itself while deprived of his amiable presence. Thus, it pursues the right course until it finds the great goal, where all its inclinations and longing shall be satiated. Hence, Thou canst estimate the listless ignorance of mortals and how few stop to consider the mysterious order of the creation and justification and all the works of the Almighty tending towards its exalted end. From this forgetfulness flows so many evils endured by men while they appropriate so many earthly goods and deceitful delights as if they could ever find in them their ultimate end. The height of perversity opposed to the order of the Creator is that mortals in this transitory and short life rejoice in visible things as if they were their last end, while they ought, on the contrary, to make use of creatures to gain, not lose the highest good. Do thou therefore, my dearest, be mindful of this dangerous human folly. Consider all delights and joys of the world as insanity, its laughing as sorrow, sensible enjoyment as self-deceit, as the source of foolishness, which intoxicates the heart and hinders and destroys all true wisdom. Live in constant and holy fear of losing eternal life, and rejoice in nothing except in the Lord until thou obtainest full possession of him. Fly from conversation with men and dread its dangers. If sometimes God places thee in the way of human intercourse for his glory and by obedience, although thou must trust in his protection, yet never be remiss or careless in guarding thyself from contamination. Do not trust thy natural disposition when there is question of friendship and close intercourse with others. In this consists for thee a greater danger, for the Lord has given thee a pleasing and mild disposition, so that thou mayest naturally incline toward him. Resist none of his intentions, and make a proper return for the blessings bestowed upon thee. But as soon as thou givest entrance to creatures into thy heart, thou wilt certainly be carried away and alienated by them from the highest good, and thou wilt pervert the intentions and operations of his infinite wisdom in, in thy behalf. It would certainly be most unworthy of thee to divert that which is most noble in thy nature toward an unseemly end. Raise thyself above all created things and above thyself. Perfect the operations of thy faculties and set before them the exalted perfections of thy God, of my beloved Son and thy spouse, who is beautiful, amazing, uh, beautiful among the sons of men. Love him with all the powers of thy heart and soul.